Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on the time zone. Uh, welcome to another Global Talk organized by the United Nations Association Poland. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our next honorable guest and expert, uh, Sir Mark Lowcock, the United uh, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emerging Relief Coordinator, and also the head of the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Welcome to uh, our global talk, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's a great honor for us. Well, it's a delight for me, a real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thank you very much once again. And uh, without further ado, I think we can actually move on to the, some of the questions, which I guess uh, are very important these days. Uh, to start with the, the first one, uh, as we observe many uh, humanitarian crises and armed conflicts, and this seems to be a never ending story actually. Uh, so what would you say about the current, the biggest challenges for the humanitarian action sector today, and especially how the, the current pandemic of COVID-19 uh, has affected this situation, the situation of the humanitarian operations around the world? Well, let me first say that I think it's useful to remind ourselves of some of the ways in which the world has improved over the last 50 or 60 years. You know, during the course of my lifetime, I'm 58 years old, during the course of my lifetime, the average human experience for the kind of average person on the planet has improved quite a lot. People live longer than they used to live, children are more likely to go to school, infants are less likely to die before they reach the age of five. Um, the world is, um, notwithstanding all the current problems, a bit more stable and peaceful than it used to be. More people live in democracies and so on. And so for, for the majority of people on the planet, life has got a little bit better over recent times. The, the difficulty we have at the moment is that the rate of progress has been um, not the same across the whole planet. And in, particularly in the countries where I work, which are countries affected by conflict and climate change and especially severely affected by the pandemic, um, things are not getting better um, in those countries. And um, indeed, it, it, in too many of them, things are deteriorating. So the, the biggest cause of humanitarian problems in the world at the moment, and there are about 2% of the world's population who suffer particularly from these problems, are firstly conflict, the world has got less good over recent years in preventing and resolving conflict. Second, climate change, where um, more droughts and storms and cyclones and floods and so on are posing a big, um, creating enormous pain and suffering for people in very fragile countries. Uh, and thirdly, now the, the contraction, the economic contraction arising out of the pandemic, that has been um, a huge additional contributor during the course of 2020 to humanitarian suffering. The good news is the world does have very good humanitarian agencies, the UN agencies, the Red Cross, the international NGOs, including many Polish um, NGOs, and they do a good job in getting help to people in the most extreme crises. So it used to be the case that all of these problems, conflicts and natural disasters and so on that we see in front of us today used to lead to huge loss of life around the world. Famines, for example, were very common around the world with massive loss of life throughout almost all of human history. But the world has got better at dealing with problems when they arise. Um, and my job is to um, spot humanitarian problems when they come up, develop plans to deal with them, and then raise the money to enable those plans to be implemented. And there are, just in terms of the UN, there are 50,000 colleagues, uh, men and women who work to try and relieve the suffering of ordinary people in humanitarian crises and they definitely um, save millions of lives every year. Um, so we have lots of problems but things would be even worse if we didn't have this relatively effective response system. Thank you very much for this uh, for your answer and that actually makes me think that actually in the past we used to think of the humanitarian workers as just some altruist people. Now it's just a profession with heart, with big heart, with passion, with that's kind of the professionalization of the humanitarian sector, which I believe is also important to respond to the, uh, those challenges you've mentioned. And this actually also leads me to the, another question I'd like to pose. Um, it's very often to see that the crisis, the humanitarian crisis or armed conflicts that are ongoing currently 
are very often comes down to the criticism of the United Nations for not being effective enough in the um, actually providing the objects uh, and the objects and the purposes deriving from the UN Charter. And this is a very, very common attitude of the international society of the public. And sometimes uh, it is also the problem of the lack of effective uh, decision making in the UN Security Council. So the question I'd like to pose is, is it even possible for how can we uh, mobilize more the international community um, to respond more effective to the humanitarian crisis going on? Because it seems to average person that the, the question of the humanitarian needs or human rights shouldn't be the question of the conflicted, uh, conflicting state's interest. However, we see it's slightly different. Yeah, so the, the, the United Nations basically um, is representative and can do what its member states want it to do. Um, the UN, in one way of thinking about it, is a stage on which the member states, including in the Security Council, talk to each other and engage to um, address and resolve problems that they share or issues they want to progress. And if you think about the UN like that as a stage with the General Assembly where all the leaders meet or the Security Council or lots of the other groupings in which member states meet in the UN, the, the, the UN there is really just the place where the member states, the countries of the world meet. And so if they disagree on things, that might be played out on the stage that is the UN, but it's actually a disagreement between member states. Um, of course, it's good that we have this forum where dialogue can take place and issues can be discussed. It's always better to have somewhere to talk about problems than nowhere to talk about them. And that is one of the successes of the UN, even in cases where the um, member states disagree. And you know, Poland would have seen some of that in the two years recently when Poland was on the Security Council. It's still better to have somewhere to talk about the disagreement and to try to find some way forward. The UN, though, is also, in another way of thinking about it, an actor on the stage. And what a lot of the humanitarian agencies do, like the Refugee Agency, UNHCR, or the World Food Programme, just won the Nobel Peace Prize, or UNICEF, our Children's Agency, they are organizations funded voluntarily by member states, including Poland, who, when there's a problem, deploy their staff and get help to people in need. And the humanitarian agencies <coughs> of the UN, through the, the work that I coordinate, reach 100 million people a year in these humanitarian settings. Um, and last year, we raised $18 billion to do that work from voluntary contributions. This year, probably we'll raise $20 billion. Without that, things would be even worse. So we do relieve a lot of suffering and um, save millions of lives every year. Um, and that's in our guise as an actor um, in conflict settings and so on. But the, the UN is not um, a state. It's not um, a, an organization with its own army, which can impose its wish on other people. We are a uh, most of the time we're a forum in which some nation states get together and try to find um, solutions to things they disagree about. Uh, thank you very much. And that actually leads me to my other question, as uh, you've mentioned this, uh, the question of the funding uh, for the humanitarian sector and the co national contributions. Uh, so I would like to ask you, how do humanitarian and development organizations cooperate uh, actually to implement kind of very similar goals to improve the situation of the people living in the uh, areas of the humanitarian crisis and armed conflicts, uh, how they incorporate during, uh, sometimes before, during and after the, the humanitarian crisis, uh, how this partnership will look like. Humanitarian agencies are extremely good at um, intervening and getting people life-saving help and saving lives when there's a crisis and a problem. But what humanitarian agencies don't do, it's not our um, task, is to solve the underlying problems. Now, most of the underlying problems um, relate to things like um, climate change or conflict or things like the pandemic. Now, those problems themselves have causes. And what, what the development system is trying to do and what each nation state is trying to do is grow the economy and create more opportunities for people so that the underlying causes of problems are addressed better. 
uh, in, in other parts of its work, the UN is clearly very engaged in <coughs> trying to promote agreement on how to mitigate and then adapt to climate change. If we're successful in doing that, and we slow down the rate of warming of the planet, probably we'll have fewer droughts and severe weather events than we would have if we don't slow down global warming. Um, if we make better progress at um, dealing with conflict, and conflict of course have their own causes, often in resource scarcity or um, competition over um, power in a country or disagreements between different groups in a country, what you find is if countries get richer um, and countries um, provide means of citizens having a say and being engaged and being able to express themselves, typically um, that reduces the risk and likelihood of conflict. It's very rare for democracies, for example, to get into conflict with each other. So the more you can um, develop economically and socially and create um, opportunities for people, the less likelihood you run into conflict problems. Pandemics are a difficult thing to deal with, obviously, and we're in the middle of the worst one now for 100 years. But um, the more we invest in science and technology, the more we build public health systems, um, the better we're likely to be able to cope with future pandemics. And unfortunately, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 pandemic, is unlikely to be the last problem of this sort that we have. But by building up scientific and technical knowledge and strengthening public health institutions, we're likely in future to deal better with those kind of problems. So what humanitarian agencies are doing is dealing with symptoms largely. What development organizations are doing is trying to address the underlying causes. And the more successful the development agencies are, the less the humanitarian agencies will have to do and the more sleep I will get and the better the world will be. Oh, thank you very much for that. Uh, it's very optimistic in a way, actually. Uh, but let's talk about maybe not so optimistic issues. Uh, I mean, the Agenda 2030, because it's just 10 years to achieve the, the goals we have established in 2015. And it seems that there are so many things that have not been achieved yet, uh, especially now the COVID situation um, has made the situation much worse. And in my opinion, uh, there are many, many goals that uh, comes down to the issue of the humanitarian needs of the people. Uh, so this all, as you mentioned, linked and co somehow linked. Uh, so in how do you perceive uh, the world after the 2030? Uh, are we going to have another agenda for sustainable development or are states already tired of establishing maybe unrealistic goals? Um, how does it look like in your opinion? Well, before the Agenda 2030, we had the Millennium Development Goals. You'll remember the eight Millennium Development Goals, and they were about reducing poverty and increasing access to education, reducing the number of women who die in childbirth, reducing the number of children who don't reach their fifth birthday. And the world was very successful, actually, making progress on those goals. The Sustainable Development Goals, which are a much broader agenda, um, there have been some things on which we have kept making progress. Until the pandemic, for example, the levels of poverty in the world are still falling. Um, but what we have run into now is a series of headwinds, basically, of which the pandemic is the biggest one. So unfortunately, this year, for the first year, for really since the 1990s, we're going to see an increase in the proportion of people around the world who live in the most extreme poverty. We're likely, unfortunately, to see reductions in life expectancy, especially in very poor countries. And we're likely, we're already seeing the impact of um, hundreds of millions of children and young people not being able to go to school. So we need to recover um, from that. I think in the better off world, that recovery will take place and begin to take root during the course of 2021. I am concerned that the COVID hangover will be harsher and longer in the very poorest countries, but the rest of the world will be wise to invest in recovery in those countries as well, because otherwise they will become the origins of greater problems which will have the potential to spread and affect everybody on the planet. Um, the, um, there will be lots of things to learn from the experience of the coronavirus and COVID-19. Some positive things to learn actually, like the acceleration of um, bedding down of the digital economy. You and I are talking to each other now in the middle of this pandemic in a way that wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago. And there's lots of um, further benefits to be exploited from 
um, you know, really uh, maximizing the opportunities of the digital economy, but it has to be available to everybody. It has to be sustained for everybody. I think there'll be opportunities to strengthen public health systems. I think there'll be a lot more investment in science and technology for medical purposes, including preparations to develop vaccines fast for future um, viruses that may emerge. One of the successes of the coronavirus period so far has been very rapid by historical standards progress towards a vaccine for COVID-19 and we can build on that into the future. But there are also going to be lots of continuing challenges and one of the biggest arises from inequality, especially inequality between countries. There's a risk that as the better off world recovers and progresses, the poorest world is left behind and um, it's going to be um, important to make the case to better off countries, all the members of the EU, North America, um, increasingly countries of Eastern Asia as well, that their interests are best served by leaving no one behind, by bringing everybody along um, to try to make the world a fairer, safer and more prosperous um, place for everybody who's on it, not just the lucky, those who are lucky. Uh, it seems sometimes that one of the most affected social groups during humanitarian crisis and armed conflicts are youth and children because they are very vulnerable. And my next question, because as we represent a youth organization in a, in a way, um, mostly young people working for United Nations Association Poland, and we keep seeing many initiatives of the United Nations promoting the um, the participation of young people in the peace building processes around the world. But is it, in your opinion, isn't just a kind of the um, very symbolic gesture important, but not really having a real impact, bearing in mind that it's still about the conflicting interests of states. This is how we make international, international policy, international law. So how would you evaluate on these uh, initiatives? Yeah, look, I think in general, the world would be better if there were more leaders who are younger and also if there were more leaders who are women. Um, I think it's, it, it is not a good thing for the world that most people in leadership positions around the world are much older men. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's the best situation to be in. I, I think it is very important for young people to feel empowered and that they can play um, a role. I'm extremely impressed by the passion and commitment and determination by lots of young people, those who are engaged, for example, in uh, model UN or young UN ex um, exercises. And of course, there are some very charismatic um, and powerful and influential young leaders around the world. Think of Malala Yousafzai, who's really shone a spotlight on um, the need for girls educated to be everywhere. Think of Greta Thunberg, who's been, become the great champion of better progress on climate change. So I think when young people do get engaged, they can be very influential, but decision makers and powerful people will be well advised to um, have more um, representative um, composition of people. So here, I guess we got some technical problems. I guess. Yeah, sorry about that. I, just get my, I lost my internet connection. No worries. Actually, we were talking uh, about the uh, these youth initiatives and you actually explained how important is the, um, the youth power and youth leadership and women leadership. Uh, can't, agree, can't agree more, uh, especially that, for instance, we might observe the institution of UN youth delegates or um, promoting also sustainable development goals, which I believe also is uh, important. Um, so I would like now to ask the two last questions, which I believe are going to be quite short, but mm, maybe kind of tricky. Uh, if we, you think about uh, the end of your term, uh, when the time comes for you to end your term uh, as the top UN humanitarian uh, officer, what do you personally hope to have been achieved? Looking at has the, how the situation is difficult right now uh, when it comes to the humanitarian affairs, armed conflicts, etc. Well, I mean, firstly, I've been doing this kind of work for 35 years now, including um, the last several years here in the UN and you know everybody should aspire to be liberated um, at some point and to be able to move on and do different things and I think it's a very good thing to be able to pass the baton on to somebody um, at some point so um, I don't know exactly when that will be for me but, but you know I think it's a good thing that, that um, you know you do it for a period and then someone else takes over that's how the world should work. What I've been trying to do is 
um, basically trying to contribute to a world in which everybody who needs humanitarian assistance and protection gets the help they need. Um, and it's been a difficult period to do that in, but certainly um, we, we reach 100 million people every year. We certainly save millions of lives a year and things will be worse without all the work of the humanitarian agencies, especially the 50,000 colleagues who are in um, countries where the crisis are happening. So what I would really like it to do is to be able to leave the humanitarian system in the best possible state to deal with continuing and future crises. Because one thing that's sure is the problems are not going away um, we will be dealing with them for much longer into the future than I will be here for. Thank you for that. And let's hope it's going to, have to be more optimistic than some other people think, uh, because it's always kind of difficult to think about the future uh, in a positive way, especially in these days. Uh, and my last question is kind of connected to the, uh, the 75th anniversary of the UN as this 2020 marks the uh, 75th anniversary of the UN founding. And I guess you keep hearing that question a lot of times, uh, but how do you, uh, what do you think about the future of this organization of the United Nations, especially these days in the times that has been claimed by many as the crisis of multilateralism, where is still place for the United Nations? And if yes, what reforms um, we need actually? Of course, not actually talking about this big structural reforms, but uh, in a few words, if you could like elaborate on your vision of the future of the UN. One of the um, early Secretary Generals of the UN um, often reminded people that um, the purpose of the UN was not to take the human species and humanity to heaven, it was to prevent it from reaching hell. So the, the UN is trying to make things better than they would otherwise be. If we didn't have a UN, we'd have to invent a UN because we have a globalized world where everything is interconnected with everything else. And the most important unit of organization is the nation state. Um, but a, a, every single nation state on the planet is affected by what happens in and by the actions of other nation states. So you have to have a forum um, where things are um, discussed and problems are identified and preferably solved. Um, and at the same time, we have always to try to make the UN as effective and efficient and relevant um, as possible. And that's a continuing task and challenge, just like in every nation state, there's a continuing challenge for the government to try to improve life and the situation and solve problems for the people of that country. So, um, that's what we need to do, be relevant and effective and efficient and responsive to the um, challenges the modern world has. That's what we're determined to do. And let's finish with that very uh, important thought that uh, I, I guess many of us might share. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for joining us today. It was a great honor and pleasure for us, I guess, uh, with other peers here in Poland and perhaps also abroad. We're going to have a great topics to discuss following, following up your great, uh, great talk. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you once again. It's a pleasure. Very nice to talk to you.